I'm Chris Whitney Cooper and I'm chair of Gathering Voices, which probably for many people are wondering what on earth Gathering Voices is, because it's a new, it, it's not an organization yet, it's a developing organization. And I suppose in a nutshell, we're a group of LGBTQA plus um, peoples and organizations that have come together in a collaboration. And that includes um, Open Table, Open Expression, Accepting Evangelicals and Evangelical Fellowship of Lesbian and Gay Christians. Now that's the, the core of us, but actually we have joined in with other groups quite a lot. So we've worked with Stonewall, we, we're working hopefully with One Body, One Faith, and all of us are want, wanting to support LGBTQA plus Christians in a kind of safe space that provides an open conference uh, where we can explore our faith as LGBTQA Christians. And that's really important. So we're all in a usual place at the moment. We're all in our own environments, which is um, difficult for us to put on a large gathering. So we can't have our usual conference where we invite people to speak and everybody to meet together because of COVID and social distancing. So as a uh, steering group, we've decided to have this pre-conference discussion and then we're going to have a half day conference on the 17th of October, all being virtual. So it's all new for us um, and, all, and a very different way of behaving, but hopefully that will be a safe space. We'll do something on um, YouTube that will be pre-recorded and something on Zoom so that we can actually have an op opportunity for people to meet and talk and share in that safe space. So the virtual conference is called uh, 2020 Vision, Seeing More Queerly, Breaking False Binaries in Gender and Sexuality. So a huge amount packed into a very small title. Um, and to help me, uh, I've got a number of people with me who are going to hopefully help us unpack what some of that means and help us to think about it in preparation for the conference. So I have with me Alex Claire Young, uh, G. Day McCauley and Rachel Mann. So really pleased that you're all here and really thank you for your time with us. But before we start exploring anything, I'd really li like you to just to say who you are and something about you know, where, where you come from um, in, in your own words. So shall we start with Alex? Would you like to just come in and just say who you are and, and why you're here? Hi, I'm Alex. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm a trans masculine person. So I began to transition from female towards male around 10 years ago. I identify somewhere kind of slightly masculine of center and I'm a minister in the United Reformed Church. Um, I minister mainly to an online church called Church Spacious, but I also work under the banner Transgender Christian Human. And in that work, I offer pastoral support to trans people and their loved ones. And I provide some education and advocacy to schools and churches and communities as well, because lots of people want to know more and just don't know where to start. I'm also doing some doctoral study um, into the theologies of trans Christians. So finding out lots of different things about what different trans people think. Um, I'm married to Joe, who's also a minister. We live by the seaside. Um, we love spending time in the water. So that's a bit of the, the other side of me. Oh, thank you. That's really appreciated. Uh, G-Day, could you tell us something about yourself? Absolutely. Um, thanks for having me on this um, discussion and program. Um, my name is G.D. McCauley. I am the founder and CEO at House of Rainbow. Uh, House of Rainbow started 13 years ago because we found out that there was a gap uh, in providing uh, a theological need and reflection of Black African or in the Black people who are LGBT and Christians. Um, our work has evolved beyond just that. So people of diverse faith use the services and we've expanded those services to other areas of people's needs. We continue with the work of reconciling faith and sexuality. I'm also uh, a deacon in the Anglican Church and by God's grace, I will be ordained priest this year. And then um, I'm also a chaplain uh, at the uh, Mild May uh, Mission Hospital uh, in central London. Uh, so there is a lot of hat that I wear. But I think that the reality is that there is still a lot of gap in bridging um, sexuality and religion, particularly within the Christian community. And that is a big part of my work. 
No, no, thank you. That, I'm really pleased you're here. Rachel, um, would you like to talk to us about, about your um, background? Thank you, Chris. Uh, hello, I'm Rachel Mann. I'm a Church of England parish priest, an area dean. Uh, I'm a, a, a writer and poet, a theologian and broadcaster. Um, I, I think I, I'm here because um, I'm really interested in queer theology. I guess I'm a queer the theologian, a feminist theologian. I'm a trans woman and I'm really passionate, not simply about the church making available um, inclusive space for queer people, but actually excited about how queer people, LGBTQIA people can be transformative presences within the church so that there is a sense in which reformation and recreation happens rather than simply us being tolerated or included um, or even simply belonging um, that we are people who as bearers of the image of God and growing into the likeness of Christ offer a transformative place where the church can be set free to be more in God's image. Thank you. No, that's really, that's really helpful. Um, I suppose I should declare my um, background a little bit. Um, in my normal uh, day job, I'm a academic. I, I work in a university and I'm a head of school managing nursing midwifery. Um, I, I am a lesbian woman and I'm married to Jane. And uh, we, uh, we've been married for about uh, 16, well, as long as 16 years. I know that's not as long as marriage has been about, but we were upgraded. Uh, a few years ago. Um, so really nice and I'm hoping all people here who've uh, joined us uh, to, to listen to the conversation um, will enjoy the discussion that we have. Um, I've put together a couple of questions that they're not meant to be constraining but they are there to give us a basis to start and hopefully um, each of those pe people who will take the lead on that, that doesn't mean that does stop any of us providing some a clarification or information that we think will help the conversation and help us to move on. So um, the first kind of question, the first part of the um, conference title is about 2020 vision seeing more queerly and really the question we need to ask and I'd like to ask Alice to start us off is why do we need to see more queerly and and I suppose another question is does visibility matter so I don't know whether, whether you want to do those both together or one at a time, and I'll, I'll leave that to you. Yeah, I mean, those two questions kind of fit together to me. Um, there's a lot of debate about the word queer in the LGBTQ plus community, but I really identify with the word queer, and if I'm talking about my sexuality, that is the word I use. Um, and I don't expect everyone to claim it for themselves. There are as many ways of being LGBTQ plus as there are people. Um, there are so many different ways of embodying and living out these identities. But I think that in a lot of places, equality is just about getting to the point where it's okay to be in a same-sex relationship or it's okay to be trans as long as you're willing to act normal. And that for me is why queer visibility and being able to see queerly is really important. For some LGBTQ plus people, being seen as normal is really important and perhaps is, is the central thing in equality. But for others, actually being different is really important and being able to be seen as being different and being able to be ourselves in religious spaces. And that's where we haven't quite got to yet. So as a minister, um, when I say I'm trans, churches usually say, so it's none of our business. We're happy to have a trans person because they assume it's a journey that I've finished. They don't understand that actually it's a part of who I am and that it's going to continue to be a part of who I am and something that I want to talk about. If I show up in church wearing nail varnish, people are shocked because, but you wanted to be a man. Don't you just want to be a normal man? Actually being queer is about questioning and challenging being normal. It's about saying, you know what? This word was used as a slur when being normal was seen as the way you had to be. And now we're starting to say it's okay to be different. And that's really important. And it's not just important for LGBTQ plus people. 
And I think that's why visibility is really important. I want all people in the world to be able to own that part of themselves that's just a bit different from the norm and to see that we can see God in that space. That actually God is not normal. God reaches out to beyond the center. Um, God perhaps even has a special heart for the margins. God wants us to question things. God wants transformation. Um, God is this big grace space that, that can't just be held in the middle. And for me, that's why seeing queerly is really important. Some really interesting ideas there. I like the idea of us owning a name that's been used as a slur and to, to re, re, rethink it so that it becomes an important badge of honor rather than a, a slur. That's, that's really exciting. Um, I just wanted to ask um, Rachel or G-Day, did you want to come in and add to that? Or yes, Rachel? Just a very brief comment really, um, just to acknowledge that um, Alex's words go to, go to something reason, reasonably deep within me, um, that I belong to a generation of trans people, you know, someone who transitioned when I was, you know, very early 20s, back 30 years ago, that in some ways we, we, we've had to learn, or I've had to learn, I'll own that, new ways of talking about ourselves, because I think that, the, you know, the world in which I transitioned was one about there is a destination and things stop and you know, all one wants to do is disappear or be normal, um, you know, in inverted commas. And it's been a huge learning curve for me, actually, in the last last 10 years. And there's a sense in which um, I've had to achieve a, a level of humility, which isn't natural for, for me, <laughs> just in terms of understanding the confidence of of, of, of the trans community, of the queer community. I, I just find it incredibly exciting. Whereas I know some trans people of my generation panic, I think, in the face of the kind of richness of trans discourse now. Yeah, um, I, I, for me, I think it's very important. And I think, um, you know, Alex, when you started to talk about heteronormativity being seen as normal, I think this is one thing that I believe that has been forced on us. Uh, in, in many places, you know, as a black gay man of Nigerian descent, you know, um, the idea of being gay has been said to me on African and on Christian at the same time. So we have to ask the question then, what is normal for me? I feel that we need to actually interrogate, we need to scrutinize the sacred text and the sacred conversation. Because too often people will say, but the Bible condemns it. In that conversation, we need to challenge that conversation because um, obviously for the past number of years and particularly during this lockdown, you know, we've had uh, a number of seminars where we are examining what the Bible says in favor of same-sex relationship. We want people to sit down and have that conversation. We want to look at the sacred text together so that there is no misunderstanding about what has been said and, and I, as, as many of you know, the favorite one is that God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. So querying the Bible for, for myself and for, for the community that I serve is very, very important. So uh, we're definitely moving that goal and we're trying to make sure that people within our own community, you know, the people that we serve within our own faith uh, communities are also enriched by that understanding. And there's also one thing I want to say before I, I pass on back to Christian. And I think that the, the reality is that um, with visibility also comes responsibility. And that is why we've had to, we have to do well as queer theologians to make sure that we present the theology also accurately to the people listening to us. Otherwise, we are going to uh, we're not going to be able to take the word back, you know, as 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 um, as dearly as we want to. Mm, thank you. I mean, I must. I'll be honest. I agree. I think the word normal is it comes with it um, some sort of grey colour, as opposed to the diversity and the colourful way. Because even people who identify as being, and I use inverted commas, normal, um, often have a variety of of identities and experiences that are not captured. So I think it's really great that we can open up the discussion 
that we can talk about what it means to be, but what it means to be is not static. I love this idea of being on a journey and I would, I'd own that as well. My, my own faith journey, my own um, coming out journey is still opening out. Um, and I think that's really exciting. And I think that's what God's about. God is about taking you on a journey. He's not taking you on a destination. He's taking you on a way to be who you are. So, um, Alex, I think Alex really, really kicked off really nicely. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we move on? Just, I think, perhaps accidentally, we've kind of come with this binary between normal and, and queer people almost. I think I almost set that up accidentally. And some of what Rachel said really resonated to me. In my research interviews, I'm talking to all sorts of trans people and quite a few trans people who would definitely identify as having transitioned and that's done and they are fully female or fully male. And the way I talk about my identity is initially quite threatening or difficult for them. But I think as we've had conversations, they have found it helpful to be able to think about their identities in lots of different ways. And I think if we can find ways to love each other better and to be more open with each other and to challenge each other without threatening each other, then the idea of seeing more queerly can help everyone, even those people who have had to build this identity as being very normal or very normative, um, because we can help everyone to be able to explore bits of themselves and talk about bits of themselves that they've been forced to keep hidden. And that forced hiddenness has really been hurtful for some people. And I think that's something that the LGBTQ community is having to wrestle with and having to help people to overcome that forced normal. No, thank you for that. Um, yes, I'm just uh, thinking that, I mean, there's so much we could talk about. We could stay here really, um, but I'd, I'd like to move the conversation on a little bit um, and just ask Rachel. I mean, the second part of our title is uh, Breaking False Binaries, um, which in itself is a, a, a challenging statement. So can I ask you, Rachel, what does, breaking false binaries mean and why is it important? Thank you, Chris. Um, <laughs> in one sense, I feel that Alex has really taken us to, to the significance of, of, of why breaking false bi binaries matter. But where I want to begin, I want to begin in a particular theological point because I think the theological point will help us see why breaking false bi binaries is a kind of it's it's not just a moment in uh, in an academic theology but it's about our very being as the people of god and um the uh theologian marcella alphas reed says suggests that queering theology is the path of god's own liberation and I think what she's getting at there is that when we start to do something active, use queer in the verb mode, that it's something that's undergoing, that we're undergoing, that we are engaged in, both individually and as community, what begins to happen is a breaking open of a whole set of binaries that let's be clear here, can seem fixed, are presented as if they are inscribed in tablets of stone brought down from the mountain. And actually, I don't think that there's, there's grounds for that level of absolutism. It matters that we put pressure on binaries because if we don't, then A, as Alex has already beautifully brought out, we lose sight of the nuance of actual human experience. You know, I, I'm, I'm yet to meet anyone who fulfills a kind of absolute um, extreme of one binary or other. I've met people who claim that they do, but then actually when we 
unfold that we discover the nuance the complexity actually the riches and and sometimes horrifically the shame that people feel because they can't fit that bin binary because they think oh god i should be this super straight guy you know this is what a christian is i'm a super straight guy super straight woman and actually discovering the the riches and nuance and and it, it makes them feel afraid but this is about god actually for me if we are made in the image of god called yeah. into the likeness of christ which i absolutely believe is at, at the heart of the christian faith mm -hmm. then liberating liberating god from false binaries is a recipe is an opportunity a place where we can discover the true riches of ourselves i mean this is i'm going to finish by making what some people think is a very cheap point but actually i think it's a it's a very quick way of getting to the point here um one of the extraordinary things about the Christian faith is the queerness of our God. This is a God who's three yet one. Queerness is inscribed in our God. And yet, how often is he, she, they presented as this most reductionist version? And you know, this plays into all sorts of discourses about um, you know, this isn't just about sexuality or gender identity. This is about the whiteness of God, you know, or the 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 classed nature of God, the middle classness of God. So, this breaking of the of of the binary is is not mere mere politics, though politics matters. This is about our deepest human realities. Yes, Chide. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. You know, I, it really felt that I was in a Bible study class or indeed a theological uh, uh, moment. But I, I also totally agree with you. And I think that uh, th there is a culture that I'm familiar with within the, the Black community. Uh, you know, when, 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 when a, a, a parent, a, a mother is, is, is pregnant, there's this uh, tradition called revealing the gender. And this is when they had this coming together where they reveal the gender of the child. And I think that has created a lot of uh, conversation and debate within the queer community, because when we reveal one gender, when the child then become to know who they are, and they say, I am not the gender that you revealed, I am a different gender, that creates a lot of confusion. And I think that the other thing again, I'll take this again, I say this within the, the black community especially, uh, gender in a child is very, very part of the culture. And um, I'm from the Yoruba culture in Nigeria, the Yoruba tribe in Nigeria. And having a male child is seen as the best thing, even if you have 10 female child, and that is very problematic. Again, when you look at the theology of, of gender, we then see that, you know, um, it is so unimportant that there's a male or female gender. Those binaries are misconstruing of the child. And I've had to work with many families in Africa. And there was one time in South Africa where I met with um, uh, a group of mothers, we call them queer mothers of Benoni, the east of Soweto in South Africa. And I think that it's important to let the parents know that they've got children, they've got a gift from God. And the way that I often describe it is that God give you a gift this, this children as gifts, they come gift wrapped. So when you open those gifts, those are the gifts of God. And, I, and I'll close on this because I know that, you, the, the, um, I'll close on this because there, there is the power of toxic masculinity at play. There is sexism at play. There's gender hierarchy at play. And I think these are the things that we need to try to work against because they're not helpful, you know, for the communities that we serve. Thank you, Jude. Um, Alex, would you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think I might be echoing some of what's been said, although I think that's part of seeing more queerly, isn't it? That we can actually take each other's views and have a slightly different perspective and be able to kind of play with those. Um, like Rachel said, God's done it. God's done it over and over again. Our Bible is full of breaking of false binaries. And 
if we can't see that, we're struggling to be biblical at all. Um, and that's something I have really struggled with in Christianity, that there seems to be this desire to see God as being one thing who says and does one set of things. And that's not what I see in the Bible. Um, I once had a spiritual director who said, if people are harming you with the Bible, just stop reading it. And I did for a little while because I thought that was quite important. Um, and I needed a break, frankly. I couldn't read the Bible queerly because it had been hurting me. So I put it in a drawer um, for a little while. And then I took it back out again and I read it. And what I was reading wasn't what I'd been told it said because I'd been told that God was male that God set down a list of rules and that the rest of the Bible explained how people followed them. And that's actually just not what happens in the Bible. People keep trying to work out who God is and trying to follow the rules that they think God set. And then it changes all over again. And I mean, Jesus is the perfect example of that. They've got these rules about God being very far away and very distant. And God transitions almost into being human to break that false binary between God and humanity. That happens over and over again, and I don't see why it shouldn't keep happening. Um, but breaking false binaries should never just be about other people. It should never be about saying, well, those people are thinking in false binaries and I need to change their minds. It's about each of us internally as well. Um, Rachel will know because she knew me when I was very first starting to transition, but I had a very binary view of myself. Um, I was very determined to be a man and be a normal man, which makes a lot of what I say today quite ironic. I was very determined I was going to have all the surgeries and no one was ever going to know that I'd been trans. Um, and almost the opposite has happened. I haven't had all the surgeries um, and I don't identify as male and I'm somewhere in the middle and I love talking about being trans. And that's because God, I think, has been able to break down some of the false binaries that I had in myself. And I think those false binaries are a protection against pain. When we are hurt, we put these binaries in place and perhaps that was what people were doing in the Bible. You know, they just escaped from Egypt's oppression, for goodness sake, it's not that surprising that they had to build a few walls. Um, but I think God constantly works to break down those walls in us and then uses us to help break down those walls in others as well. And I, hope that those walls keep being broken down in me for my whole life. I don't want to say I'm right now or I've got to where I need to go um, because God's bigger than me and I need to be open to God changing me even more. Oh, thank you Alex. Um, Rachel did you, did you want to say anything in response to what, what you've heard um, or shall we move on? I think we can I think we can move on. I think um, I, I just really delighted by just the the nuance which Gide and Alex have brought to what I said. Just amazing. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm feeling, um, well, I'm not sure what I'm feeling, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing some, some really interesting and challenging things, which is going to make me go away and think about them differently. And hopefully will move me on in my own journey. So I am hope for that. But that, that aside, um, Gide, it would be really nice to kind of, we, we're moving in that direction anyway, but... Um, if we see more queerly and we think about breaking false by, how will this have an impact on our Christian experiences, our Christian faith? You know, I mean, I've pondered over that question and I think that seeing more queerly is about knowing the truth. And when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the things that many of us have been taught were actually quite wrong. And um, I've always said this, when every time I come to, you know, my, my Bible study class of querying the Bible, I always say that, you know, if I have a 25 year old gay man that has been told all his life that he is an abomination, how many years will it take me or anyone to reverse the abuse over that person? Um, I would take maybe another 25 years because you have to unlearn uh, the things that you've learned. And um, I, I came up with a phrase called, I called it, you know, we have to unwire to rewire. And I think that for me personally, I mean, I've been through this very journey myself. Um, you know, the Bible has always been there for me as a guide. And, you know, when Alex was talking uh, about a scholar and about, and about the Bible, I mean, my professor, Professor Mary Tobert, at the end of my training at the Pacific School of Religion in California, 
she said to us, you know, the class of um, 20, 2005, uh, yeah, 2005, she said, I present you with the Bible, you can now trill or kill. So the, the Bible was actually seen as a weapon and is also seen as a source of liberation for many. But I think that, you know, uh, to see more clearly is actually to come to a place of reconciliation, you know, to begin to drop the scale of abuse and begin to pick on the mantle of joy for who you are. And one of my favorite songs is, when the day pants for the water, my soul longs after you. I love that song because there is something about it because when you find a piece that you need as a queer person, you can't wait to tell other people about it. And that is one of the things that led me back to Nigeria to start House of Rainbow in a country that has colonial laws, that has punitive laws that punish same-sex behavior. I, don't ask me what I was thinking when I went to Nigeria, but I just know that the Holy Spirit was at work in that moment. And I think that the other thing again is that when you also think about, you know, seeing more clearly, when you look at, for example, the Black Lives Matter, you know, movement that we've seen in recent times, we're also saying to the Black community that Black queer lives matter too. You understand me? Because we're all facing the same issues. We're, we're facing racism, we're facing homophobia, even within the Black community. So there has to be a moment of, 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 of awareness. There has to be this moment of lightning of God's grace over us. And to be quite honest, I have been criticized many times, you know, by saying that G-A-Y means God adores you. I couldn't think of anything more far to the, to the truth because God adores God's queer children. God adores those who are suffering. God is always there. And you know, Romans chapter nine, oh, come on now. Romans chapter nine, verse 25 and 26 is one of those two verses I love so much because it starts by saying that those who were not loved, I will call beloved. And it concluded by saying that in the very place where it is said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called children of the living God. And when we talk about what queer people have been going through, this is very important for us to be able to examine and bring that message to the people. And there is something also very interesting about this. And I think that we need to really hear God. We need to hear what the Holy Spirit is telling us today. And um, we also need a world that is more queerly and more accepting, and particularly self-accepting. And I think this is the time, this conversation is timely for me and for many people, indeed for all of us. Mm. Well, that, very, can I just say, Jade, I love your passion. Um, and I, I've loved what I've heard, um, but I, is, uh, we're all smiling. So have any of us want to add anything, uh, Rachel, Alex, or do you think that kind of, that brings, brings it quite well together actually, but um, is there anything you feel that we should just finish with. I, I just want to say thank you, Gide. I just, that was extraordinary. Thank you. Genuinely extraordinary. And I just, I want things to rest there, really. Yeah. I, just... no, I, I absolutely agree. I think, can I just say thank you to all of you? Um, I, I, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, I, I love the things that you've said. Um, I, I love the way it's challenged me. Um, I can only speak for myself. I'm hoping that it will bring that challenge to the people who watch this um, and maybe start thinking and maybe start thinking about what um, what that might look like in a in a conference setting that we because we've only just touched on this at the moment, but there's an opportunity to start thinking about that a little more deeply. Um, in trouble with uh, the conference, I suspect at the end of it, we'll still want more, but that's great. Leave us wanting more. So. For those people who are going to be watching this, um, if you've enjoyed this, I certainly have enjoyed this, then um, the conference is going to be on the 17th of October and perhaps put that date in your diary. It's going to be a half day conference. This is new for us, but we're going to do partial recording and partial Zoom. So there's going to be an opportunity for safe conversations uh, so people can come together. And so I think you've got the conference title by now, but I'll just remind you. 2020 Vision, Seeing More Queerly, Breaking False Boundaries in Gender and Sexuality. So the details of that are going to be at the, underneath the YouTube recording. So just leaves me to say goodbye to Alex. Bye, Alex. Nice to have seen you. Bye to Rachel. And goodbye to 
G-Day. And really thank you for all that you've, done, you've talked about today. I've really enjoyed that. So I'll just say goodbye to you and goodbye from all of us. And I hope you can join us for the conference. Thank you. Goodbye.